of people here know me. This is my hometown, so um, I'm not an expert. I was an expert a couple days ago, a um, little further away. But anyway, thanks for coming. I'm a risk management specialist for Alberta Agriculture. I've been there about eight years. So I started kind of in the middle of the BSE crisis as a off-farm job, a uh, different way to survive. Um, numbers is what I do. And numbers, especially after lunch, are really, really boring. So I'm gonna change up the presentation a little bit and just talk a little bit about myself, my own experience, even though some of you have known me, you know, I'll, I won't tell any lies. But I don't want to come across as self-centered or egotistical because there are some stories that, some things that I've done that were good, some were, were bad. So as we go along, I'll stop and talk about some of that stuff. But just right out of the gate here, I see a few people that I went to high school with. Uh, remember back, uh, in the 80s, early 80s, 70s when we were growing up, life was good. Life was good in the 70s. We had good grain prices, good cattle prices. Mom and dad had the new pickups and you know, we had, we had the toys. We could race around town with our loud mufflers and chase girls. Life was pretty good. Kind of a lot like it is now. You know, we've, we've had some good grain prices, been able to upgrade the machinery. Uh, we're getting into some good cattle prices able to upgrade our, our uh, feeding tractors and stuff. So a lot of similarities to the early 80s to where we are now. So I remember back in the 80s, I started farming with my brother and my dad. My dad expanded the farm to make a living for three people instead of one. Of course, took on some debt and whatnot. So there was all these old timers driving around saying, ah, oh, geez, you guys are crazy. You shouldn't be doing that. You know, buying land, spending money, borrowing money. You know, you're going to go broke. And of course, these guys have experienced the 30s and some really tough times. So, so one of my hats today is to be that crotchety old farmer. Uh, you know, you might, these students in the room might look and say, oh, you're crazy, you know, that's, that's no good. Uh, and fair enough. But, uh, so that's one of the hats I'm gonna wear today. So to start off with, I wanna get back to those very first slides just when we first started here. We, I want you to think about your cow herd as an investment. Um, you know, this is a business, even, you know, even for some of the smaller herds. You know, it really is a business. And you know, if you don't look at it that way, that's fine. But this is how I look at it. You know, if, if we're thinking about uh, bringing another generation in, you know, as a 50-some year old, you know, I'm gonna take a block of equity invested in these cows to bring the next generation in, or the next generation, you know, I've got so much money, you know, where am I going to put it? Am I going to put it in cows or another another asset? So, start off talking about that a little bit, a little bit about profitability, and of course, risk is the stuff that I know about. And cattle price insurance—that was my life for the last eight years, developing that and helping get that going. So, that's kind of my background there. And then we're going to do some scenario analysis. I gave you those four price scenarios right at the very start. We're going to plunk them into a hypothetical farm and just, just see what it looks like. So to start off with, the cow investment. Think of it in terms of a stock market investment. It has a purchase price, a sale price, and there's dividends coming in all the way along. You make money on the dividends, the profits, and you make money when you sell out at the end and the price is higher. Or you lose money when the price is higher. So two things going on. And we have two things going on in the cow business too. When you analyze the, uh, the cow business, it's, it's no different. You've got two things going on. So. The profitability Measurement is, is pretty much the same, you know, in the stock market, you know, a, a stock, you know, earnings before interest, taxes and uh, depreciation, amortization, you know, fancy words, but it's just profit. Return on investment, you know, everybody calculates an annualized return on investment, you know, 
in one form or another, but it's, it's ROI. So. But we do the same thing in the cow business. Typically, it's profit per head, or return to equity is, is the official term that uh, you know the you know the true economists from Edmonton call it. But in the cattle feeding business, where I spent a fair bit of time, it was annualized return on investment. That's what we were looking for. We were looking to contract or hedge a return on investment. The bottom one: return on equity. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about return on equity and the difference between return on investment, return on equity. Critical point. Risk. I, I, you know, for all the students in the room, we've got to throw up the dic dictionary because everybody talks about different kinds of risk. Production risk, market risk, you know, risk of this, risk of that. But I boil it down into two things. Business risk, financial risk. These are the things that really matter. Business risk is just contains all the stuff that happens to everybody. Prices go up and down, droughts happen, borders close, you know, bad yields, good yields, volatility. It happens to everybody. Financial risk, on the other hand, is just business risk compounded by leverage. And this is where everybody in the room is different. Even though we might have exactly the same farms, if we've got different leverage, we have got greatly different financial risk. So what have we got to manage this risk? We've got cattle price insurance. It's a really good tool. It's available across Western Canada now, Saskatchewan, Alberta, for calves and yearlings and for fed cattle. But it's a short-term risk management tool. You know, it's one year. You know, I sure encourage you to, to look into it because you know, you, it does buy you that one year. But if something bad happens, and the prices go down, you'll get a payout. But the insurance that they offer you for the next year will be at a lower level. So it's good, it'll buy you the extra year. But this is a long-term investment, you know, five years plus. So what can we do? Diversification, you know, that's the stuff that our grandparents used to do. You know, a few cows, a few chickens. When I put up diversification, I'm really not saying you should have pigs and grain and different enterprises, but it's just one way of having one asset or income stream that's not correlated with the cows. You know, it can be you know an investment in a in your land. You know, your land is a separate asset that's got separate returns, different from your cows, or a stock market portfolio, or an off-farm job or a wife that works, um, you know, just, just something that it, when cows go down or cows go up, it goes the other way or stays the same. And it could be just cash in the bank, which leads to debt management. You know? Cash in the bank, debt. Probably the critical way that we can manage our long-term risk is debt management. It took me a long time to learn this, but it finally sunk in. It had to hit me with a hammer a few times. We want to avoid this kind of risk management strategy. And let's face it, you know, 10 years ago, this was it. There was nothing we could do. We didn't have insurance. We didn't have you know, our assets dropped so much. You know, there was nothing we could do. So as we look to build our herd going forward, you know, let's, let's think about avoiding this kind of thing should something bad happen. That's the crotchety old farmer driving down the road uh, saying you're crazy building, building fences. Now, for the students in the room, if you want to take notes, and the teachers, if you want to have an exam, write this down. This is critically important. Debt financed expansion designed to increase profitability through efficiencies will destabilize returns enough to increase the risk of failure. Just think about that a little bit. Frank Novak was a professor of mine at university. 
And he, I have to quote it because I don't think anybody's written it any, any better than that. You know, we spend all this time managing our costs, which is good, getting to be low cost producers, which is good. But at the same time, if we have debt and add debt to make those things efficient, we're running the risk of bigger loss. And just as an example of the math, here we are, two identical farms. We've got the same business risk, you know, the same drought, you know, we've got the same crops. You know, Rick DeHod, he's the banker back there. He's got farm number one. You know, he's a little smarter. He doesn't have any debt. He's got a million dollars in assets, just like I do. I'm going to be farmer number three. We've got the same assets, except I've got $250,000 in, in equity. He's got a million dollars in equity, no debt. So the same wreck comes, comes along. Calf prices are down for a few years. The value of our cows drop. Our assets both drop the same. We each lose $100,000. Except Rick, he's only lost 10% of his equity. You know, no big deal. Me, on the other hand, over here on the right-hand side, that same drop, I've lost 40% of my equity. That's when the bankers in the back room come, come knocking on your door and say, hmm, we need a little bit more security for our operating loan or you're gonna have to go elsewhere. You know, kind of an extreme, but that's reality. You know, worked in Acme for a bunch of years in the, in the late 90s. That was the thing we did. Have a dollar, borrow three, and go for it. Tremendous returns. Flip this around. The, the assets go up $100,000. We're making money. Rick only makes 10%. I make 40%. You know, you know, I'm the hero when things go good. But that's reality. That's, that's the way the cattle feeding business works. High risk, high debt. The guys that have really grown in the cattle feeding business, you know, have, have played that high leverage game, the high debt. But they're the same guys that know and understand futures, options, risk management, contracts. You know, they're leveraged, so when things go up, they're winning big, but they're also managing their risk on the downside. So. Important relationship, and I'm going to come to this right at the very end again, because uh, it, it's the real world. Um, this, is, this is what I did, you know, farm number three in 25% equity. 2001, came back, saw an opportunity to rent about 2,000 acres of land just east of town here. Had a bunch of custom cows to run. The kids were all just graduating from high school, ready to go. So I think, well, if I'm ever going to do it, now is the time. So let's go for it. But the thing we had, we didn't have much equity, but we did have an exit strategy. We did have a business plan. So that by 2005, you know, we were ahead of the curve. We knew our cost of production. We could, did our financials. You know, we knew things were going south. You know, the equity in the house wasn't going, getting risked with the farm. But, uh, you know, when BSE hit, I think, oh my God, you know, I'm supposed to know this. I've got a university education, been through the 80s. Why would anybody do it? So, you know, bang your head on the wall. But when I look back now and say, you know, was that debt bad? You know, did we make a mistake by going into debt in order to get into the cow business in the 2000s? And I have to say, no, we didn't. It was right for us. We had a plan. And when I look back, I wouldn't change it for a minute. So for me to have the crotch of the old farmer hat on and say, you shouldn't go into debt to expand your cow herd, you, know, you can't do that. My message here is, if you're going to go into debt to expand your cow herd, at least you know, have a plan so when things do go bad, that your farm doesn't go down. You, know, you don't destroy your family. Um, like a lot of things happened, you know, a lot of bad things happened in the 80s. 
Um, so if you plan for it, you know, have an exit strategy, you know, go for it. But just understand this relationship. When you do go into debt, or if you do, understand it. But, and I know there's some people in, in the room that uh, you know, don't need to use debt, but some will. So. Anyway, that's, that's my preaching part of the, the, uh, the lecture here. On to the numbers part. At the start, first thing this morning, I gave you four price scenarios. So I'm going to plug them into a farm model, an Excel spreadsheet, fairly, fairly complicated, but numbers is what I do. Um, learned that in school. All I'm going to do over the next few slides, and they're all going to be numbers and charts and stuff, so don't, don't, scare you, don't let me scare you away. All I'm going to do is take what you guys do intuitively every day in your own way, and I'm just plugging it all into one little computer model. You know, you know your feed costs. Uh, you know, you work on that. It's a big cost in this area. So you manage that. You manage your variable and fixed costs. You know, you know your production. You know your weaning rates. You know, you, you do really good at managing those things. Um, you know, price forecasts. We talked about this morning when Kevin Greer was here. You know, everybody needs a vision of the future. You know, we know it's all going to be wrong, but at least you know, the price forecasting. So, I'm taking all those things that you are, that you do all the time, putting numbers to them, sticking them in a spreadsheet, and doing some analysis. So that's that's all I'm going to do for the next few slides. So don't let the numbers intimidate you. The first thing I did when I set up this hypothetical farm was figured out my feed costs. And what I did, fairly straightforward, figured out the pounds per head per day of each of the commodities. And of course I played with it a bit to see which would be cheaper. Um, the key to is I used cow bites. Cow bites is a ration balancing program from Alberta Agriculture. Um, there's a brochure at the back. Um, other people know more about it than I do. I just know how to use it and I know that it works because I've used it since 1995, and it's really good. So either learn how to use it. Chances are your nutritionist learns how to use it, but you know, test your feeds, balance your rations using that or something like it. So in this example, that's what I did. Figured out some hypothetical rations. Made a ration for some breeding heifers because in this farm, I'm going to start with a certain number of head replace the culls with red heifers every year. So I need a ration to background the, the heifers. Now, pretty straightforward. I'm going to graze them on, on grass, so pretty simplistic view of, of grazing. You know, I know what my, uh, my land rent is, my pasture rents. I just worked it back to a dollar per head per day um, for example purposes, so yours will be different. fixed and variable costs. This is probably the hardest part of doing an analysis like this. Uh, John Reed's going to come up and talk after me. And he's dealt with a lot more farmers than I have. I just assumed that most people would have an income statement and balance sheet made by the accountant. Like we always did. It was just, just did it. Um, so these numbers here are actually taking that income statement for the whole farm that the accountant provided us and just pulling it apart, splitting it up between the grain enterprise, personal use, and the cow enterprise. You know, just kind of arbitrary. So we pulled those numbers out, and this is what we ended up with. Uh, we were, for this farm, $60,000 is what we accounted for personal, personal withdrawals um, the standard way to talk about it is unpaid labor, so, but when I calculate the right results, there is a num number in there for our work. Paid labor, and all these other things, so if you don't already do this, um, I'll leave it to John, he can talk more about it, but uh, notice to reader, uh, income statements, balance sheets, really important for figuring out your cost of production. Okay, so the, this is the, the herd. 
we're going to buy 350 head of cows. Figure that just a decent, decent herd that uh, one and a half people, two people can look after. And I valued them at $2,600. You know, it can be 350 head or 10 head. Um, the size really doesn't matter. The numbers are all the same. So I said the starting value is 2,600. And the, the value at the end is gonna be 2,600 as well. So we're, we're not gonna play with the increase in value of the investment until the very end, increasing or decreasing value. We're just gonna look at the profits from operations, you know, the dividends, what they might be. Separate that out and then we'll look at the, the value later. And I've used the extreme debt to equity, 25% equity, just to show the difference in risk between the debt levels. Here again, you guys know all this. I just plunked in these numbers. Like, you guys manage a lot of different things that I've put numbers to. Uh, cull rate, uh, cull rate for the breeding heifers that don't make it into the herd. Um, bulls per cow, you know, your sale weights. All of these blue colored letters or numbers drive the final results. And they're all management points that you guys look after and you have to deal with, you know, daily. I've just guessed at some numbers. You know, I said the, rep the bull cost is gonna be $5,500. I don't know if that's true or not, but you have to forecast. If you're going to invest in a cow herd, you, know, you have to make these forecasts. Even if you're wrong, you'll know that you're wrong and you can shift around accordingly. So these are the assumptions that I'm using. This little box here, steer and heifer cow price, those are the prices you looked at at the very start, the four scenarios. All we're gonna do is just change those numbers in that box and look at the change in the profitability. So, scenario A, 10% increase from the previous year, 5%, so you know, the more bullish scenario. Some pretty good results. Return on investment, 24%. That's average annual, so, you know, gonna make a million bucks over the five years. You know, we're gonna average $641 a head profit per cow. So, big dollars. Return on equity. There's the two numbers that I talked about before. You know, the guy with no debt only made 24%, but because things are good, the guy with debt you know, was making money on his and the bank's money. Key point, cash flow per head after financing. We've got good cash flow. So if you're young, you can borrow the money, make the interest payments, pay the principal, pay yourself, life is good. It takes 3.1 years of calf and cull sales to pay for those cows. You know, we're hoping this happens, and it, and it just might. Scenario B, this is the one where the majority of you voted. Um, Kevin Greer pretty much agreed. You know, he, he, or when I heard him and driving in the car with him for three days, he's a pretty optimistic that this kind of scenario you know, is likely to happen. Here again, 18% return on investment, bigger return on equity. Not as good as the first case. But if you look at the cash flow in scenario B, you know, we've got a 15% drop in 2018 in price. But we're just tight on cash flow. We can make the, we can make the principal and interest payments. And by 2019, it's going to be even tighter. So what typically happens then? Well, we've got to dip into our... Uh, personal withdrawals, our unpaid labor, or maybe we don't retain quite as many heifers, or squeeze the business somewhere else. So, you know, it's still really close, but that's something to watch for. It takes 3.6 years to pay for the cow. Life is still pretty good in this scenario. Scenario C, I actually thought most of the people would would pick this, this scenario. 
but then I'm looking at uh, futures markets and different things daily and uh, probably a little bit more conservative than uh, the average person. In this case, you know, cash flow is tight right through. You know, there isn't enough money to make the principal and interest payments. Even though prices are still pretty good. Steer prices, 242, you know, 217. You know, last year we'd have thought those were good prices. So, like I said, we're, we're tight for cash flow, so we need something else to help make those payments. Either we need less, less expenses, or next row down, you know, the, the bankers have been really good over the last 10 years. Uh, maybe we don't make all the principal payments. You know, so without the principal payments, you know, we've still got some cash flow. We can make the interest, you know, we're gonna survive. It's not a disaster. Lots of information here, I'll keep going. Scenario D, the lower price scenario. Here again, dropping to 141, 134. You know, is it possible? Sure it's possible. You know, we, we were down there, what, a year or two ago? Not last year, year before, that was the price. You know, is it highly likely? Probably not, but uh, you know, I didn't think the borders would close and uh, tell cows would drop to nothing either. So in this case, you know, the cash flow is really tight. It takes more than five years to pay for the cows. We're losing 80 bucks a cow every year, over 80 bucks. Return on equity, minus 11% annualized per year. So at the end of five years, the banker is going to come and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. You know, if we don't manage the equity. Return on investment, one, minus 1.1. 1 .1. So the guy didn't borrow any money. Yeah, no. yeah he's not uh, maybe buying a new truck quite as often as he was before. Losing a little bit, so. Anyway, we're getting closer to the end, so. Here's some more numbers, and don't be intimidated by the numbers. They're just some sensitivity tables. We started off with that cow at $2,600 on the left-hand axis, read across to the right, 40.6% um, return on equity. That was, that was the number in that C, C price scenario. But what happens if the uh, price of calves drops 20, 20%? Move over to the left to the minus 20% row. So, everything else being the same, our return on equity goes down to 4.7%. You know, it's, it's a pretty big drop. We're gonna have cash flow problems, but we're still gonna survive. But now think of this cow in terms of your stock market portfolio. You know, you haven't, you haven't had dividends, you're losing a little money here. What's the cow gonna be worth in five years? Is she still going to be worth $2,600 with a 20% drop in price over five years? Probably not. The cow is probably not going to be at 26, where I put her at the start. It's going to be something less. So look up the line. You know, you know we could be back to a minus 20% loss, average over five years. You know, a small move like that can take you out of business if you're highly leveraged and don't have a plan. In BSE, the value of our herds dropped, you know, dirt cheap in a matter of a couple of months. Well, it was, it was days, but before people really realized what the cows were worth, um, you know, they were at 300 bucks. The value of uh, sampling them. So the argument to the banker then, you know, when I was doing it was, okay, well, we know we're gonna lose a little bit on the operations, you know, it doesn't look very good, but damn, in, in a couple of years, these cows are gonna go from 300 to back up to 1200 bucks, and we're gonna have that return on investment because our assets are gonna go up. Well, it took a little longer than I was prepared to ride it, so hence, I'm working for the government, but uh, we still have cows. Anyway, that's beside the point. 
efficiency. Um, we all have good cows and some not so good cows in the herd. What are they worth? They're worth a lot more, the good ones are worth a lot more than the poor ones in these high price scenarios. We started at $2,600, you know, there's our 40% return. But it doesn't take much to get a calf that's worth 10% more, either 10% heavier or brings a little better price, you know, grades better at the packing plant. 10% isn't much better than average you know, to get. Look down, find the 40% in the 10% column, read back to the left. So two cows that look the same, but one produces a calf that's worth 10% more. You know, that cow is $400 more. So I guess just a, a sidebar is if you're gonna buy cows, in my opinion, in these prices, you know, spend the money and buy a good one. You know, in BSC, you know, calves are worth nothing. You know. Oh, you can spend your money everywhere. <laughs> um, but, you know, Grant is right. You know, there, there's gains to be made everywhere now that we don't have all those old cows, you know, eating our pastures down. But at the same time, if we're gonna buy cows, let's buy good ones. Or if, if, we're, gonna, if we're going to, uh, you know, cull our cows, you know, you know, we didn't cull heavy when, when cows were cheap. You know, cull cows are, you know, they've got a pretty good market value now. So why not take advantage of it and cull deep when you can, when they're worth something. Anyway, that's just a personal opinion. Grant and I can argue about uh, where you should spend the money uh, on grass or genetics. You know, we can do that over coffee and we'll never resolve it. The result answer is, you know, they're both good things. You know, you, you've got a whole bunch of things to manage in your cow herd and uh, you're gonna manage it the way you want and get the results that you want. The last number slide. Back to my, my sermon in the middle of the presentation. Here's me with my 25% equity, 40% return on equity. Here's Rick with his 100%, 0% line. Calves drop 40%, Rick loses 6%. I lose 31%. You know, I'm out of business in a couple of years. Rick's still going. Same token, things are good. I'm the hero. Yeah, Rick does pretty good too, but I do better because I'm making money on the bank's money. Yeah. It's just math. Anyways, to wrap it all up, think of your cows as a long-term investment. Market value up and down. Profits, costs, you know, know your cost, know, know where those numbers are. You know, agriculture, the DAs have been preaching, know your cost of production for 20 years. You know, it's, it's not easy, but one step is spend a few bucks on an accountant and a bookkeeper, get it, an income statement and a balance sheet. And of course, do some of these profitability and cash flow statements. You know, you don't need to be fancy like this. You know, I just did what you guys normally do in a short period of time. And make sure you know the risks, you know. Especially you young people. You know, if you're gonna take on the, the debt, you know, know what can happen. You know, you don't want to put your parents at risk, you know. You, you need that exit strategy to say, well, God, you know, I'm taking on all this debt. Are we going to watch our parents you know, you know, lose their farm or get in tough, you know, use up their retirement? I don't think anybody wants that. So have a plan. You're young. You know, when we farmed out here, you know, we had a plan and uh, we weren't going to risk the equity in the house. And our advantage was is I kind of learned some of these numbers in school so I could see ahead. 
I did monthly cash flows. You know, I knew before the banker was going to phone that the operating loan was going to be tight, so I could phone him up first and say, we're going to be tight, and this is what we're going to do about it. So it was just an, you know, when you have that plan, exit strategy, you know, the decisions, even though they're hard, they're easier. You, know, you just do it. So you're young, you can start again. I had the advantage, you know, I'd been to school, so it, you know, it wasn't going to bother me. Got a class one driver's license, I can still go drive a truck. So, debt management, important. Probably the most important long term thing. So, and like I said, I'm not saying don't go in debt, have a plan. So. <laughs>